Last week was known as, uh, on the calendar, it was called Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost Sunday is a Sunday that happens 50 days after Easter, seven full weeks plus one day. It's also known as the Feast of Harvest. It's been laid out in Exodus chapter 23. But even more, it marks the, uh, the birthday of the church. Okay? And it's not just, I'm not talking about just here at Kettering, but I'm talking about the birth of the New Testament church as it was the day that promises and prayers, that the promises and prayers that Jesus was speaking were fulfilled when the Father sent the Comforter or the Helper. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. As your pastor, I purposely waited today to celebrate and share on Pentecost Sunday until this week for the reason that I wanted to be able to be here and one to teach on it, but also to prepare our hearts for what God wants to do tonight in our, our Pentecost service together. But I can say that as I, I was studying, I sensed the other day that this morning's message, uh, that the Lord had other plans for us. I was planning on teaching this summer on the names of God. I was going to teach through and, and cause I know folks are in and out throughout the summer and, and I wanted to have, a, um, sometimes it's hard to do a series through those so individual times. And I was planning on going in that direction. And I realized that, um, as I was studying for the Pentecost Sunday for this message this morning and for what we'll see tonight with our guest speaker and everything that's coming, I, I realized that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit cannot be just relegated to one Sunday. But what, it, what if we took the whole summer to do it and to do an in-depth study and, and to have moments of practicum where we experience his purpose and his presence? And as soon as I saw, I, we have an app that we share, a texting app that we share with our staff, and I, I messaged them, and I said, hey, this is what I'm thinking about, and immediately the response was, we're like, yes, this sounds right, yes, that's good, we're excited. So today, I just want you to know, I'm kicking off a series for this summer uh, in regards to Holy Spirit and, and answering the question, really, who is Holy Spirit? I invite you to join along on this journey with me. There will be weeks that we'll step aside and cover other topics like holidays and things like that. But all summer long, we're going to be digging in on Sundays. If you're not able to be here, I encourage you to join us online and watch or to stop by our app or uh, our, our YouTube page, Facebook, whatever, and watch afterwards so you can continue on with what God is speaking and you don't miss one of the components. But I, I know that there's an expectation then when we talk about Pentecost Sunday, we talk about the Holy Spirit because, you know, we're a Pentecostal church. That's, that's who we are. You know, so what is a Pentecostal church? And what is Pentecostal? Be, uh, being a Pentecostal church by definition means that we believe that all Christians, all those who have surrendered their life to Christ, should seek a post-conversion religious experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This ideal, idea, mentality, this format of doctrine comes from our understanding of the scriptures of Acts chapter 2 through 4, when God fulfilled the, the scripture from John 14 and sending the helper to be with us. But for many, Pentecostalism is, is and has just become about speaking in an unknown tongue. It's what, the, what it's been relegated to. That, that we understand the Holy Spirit. We understand what he does just by the element of speaking in tongues. I, um, in, essence, in, essence, in essence, I, I believe that you know, Pentecostal theology is so much more than just praying in an unknown language. It's called glossolia. It's, it, it should be the believer willing to walk out what a spirit-filled life is and, and that every aspect of our life is, is marinated in the Holy Spirit and what Holy Spirit wants to do in and through us. That it shouldn't be some foreign understanding like, oh, that's weird. Well, what's made it weird is because we have, there are weird people, number one. Okay, let's just say that. But there's also doctrines that don't support fully biblically what we see and read throughout the scripture. There should be this walking out of the fullness of God's word as we sense his spirit and his presence guiding us to live out what his word says. This teaching on Pentecostalism being just about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and just about speaking uh, in tongues is, is the tip of the iceberg. 
And it's something that as pastors and church leaders, we've made the end all when in actuality, it's just the beginning. I don't know if you've ever read one of those books. The, um, growing up, I, I would read the, um, I mean, it was just a boy thing. I don't know. But I, I read the books where you, you begin to read it and you get to the bottom of the page and it, and it says, uh, you need to choose, like, would, should Johnny do this or should Johnny do that? And you choose the next version of where Johnny's going to go. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? Anybody, yeah, thank you. I see some hands. I'm not the only one. Come on, Joe, come on. And so we did it. So you turn to these, so, you know, first off, as a boy, you would want to read that book for school, right? Because the awesome part was there was really like three books in the one, but if you followed the one journey, you only had to read a third of the book and it counted as a whole book in the book reading club, right? I got a sticker for the whole book at the library because I read it. But in the likeness of those books, when an individual surrenders their life to Christ, they will walk through the story of who he is and they'll find their name written in the book of life as described in Revelation. But there are also places in their journey where they can choose to turn to this page and experience the next series and story of their life with Holy Spirit. The journey of life without the baptism of the Holy Spirit is still a good journey. Many times we say, well, you're a second rate or you're a second class citizen, you're a second, you're, oh, your church, you know, you believe in the Bible, you believe that Jesus died, you believe in the blood, we believe in all that, but you don't believe in the Holy Spirit moving in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're like, well, you're second class, right? It's like you're put at the back of the plane. And sitting in the back of the plane is not all that bad. It gets there, maybe not as quick as the, I mean, it lands first. And the other thing, if you sit in the back, those things never go down backwards. They only go down in the front. So if they go down, I'm good, right? No, it's, we're not second-class citizens because, but, but we've made it that way. And, and while, there, while an individual chooses maybe to not or has not had the experience of understanding or being part of, an, uh, of a healthy environment in a church of what it means to, to talk about the baptism and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I can't discredit, I shouldn't discredit someone. I should still celebrate that their name's written in the book of life. But then I also say, listen, but, but if I just, you know, offside of my notes, if I would just say it, there's a whole lot of people that are baptized in the Holy Spirit that don't live like it. Right? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, and this is not what my message is fully about this morning, as we talk about Holy Spirit, is you, know, you may speak in this other tongue, but, but if you still gossip, what good is it? If you still struggle with all these other areas, if you're still doing all these other things, if your life, you know, you've seen the meme maybe on Facebook, if you're there and you say, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit just doesn't give you, you know, the prayer language, but it also gives you the wisdom to shut up and to say, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry I said that. To quiet your mouth, okay? I know. The kids are in kids' church, so we go from there, right? You don't, we don't say that word. But we should advocate while some you know, walk through the journey, we should still advocate that is also something that we all should pursue as we grow in our walk with Christ. Why not receive and desire everything that God has for you? Not just a portion, not just a little bit. I mean, if you, you go someplace, they're like, listen, you go to the buffet, you're like, some of you are like, I can't eat the buffet because I, I barely eat one plate. Now, that's not my story. Really? Did you hear that like gasp of my wife? <laughs> like we went to, we were in Puerto Rico and we found in this last trip and we, we found a, a China buffet, right? And, and well, that's how they say it, China buffet. Okay. And so while they're there, I'm like, listen, y'all. And the, the, the host, the, the uh, college president paid for it uh, and he didn't tell his wife he was paying for it, but he paid for our whole crew. And I said, do you want the receipt? He's like, no, we hide the receipt. Okay, good. <laughs> So I looked at our team. I said, you are going to eat all of this food. We're going to eat. I mean, if you go to, to a buffet, you don't like order from a buffet and say, I'm just going to take one plate. Now, you know, we went to a buffet at the Dare Dutchman last week. And, you know, some people in our group, not mentioning names by Doug, chose not to have a salad. But he was like, I'm just going right for the meat. Like you go to a buffet, you eat it all. Like I'm going to get my money's worth. We act like that. We're like, pull it out. We tie the little thing. Some of you get those crawfish boiled and all that. Tie your napkin and you're all ready to go. But when it comes to the thing of God, we're like, yeah, that's not comfortable. I'm not, I don't need that. I don't need that part. When God has so much available to you, 
That we can, we can, you know, we can come to the smorgasbord of the buffet of who he is and what he has for us in our lives. Why do we hold back in some areas, but we give in and we go for some other areas? We should desire everything that he has for us. An important aspect and reason for my teaching on Holy Spirit is the fact that there are so many things that are said about him that, that are not real and are not true, and they present uh, a wrong doctrine. Over the course of the next so many weeks, because I, I say so many weeks because really I'm just going to follow his lead, we're going to walk through a variety of areas that are influenced and necessary to better understand who Holy Spirit is and what he wants to do in your life. And in and, and my mindset, so you understand where I'm, where I'm going, we're going to begin to write a job description of who Holy Spirit is and walk through each of the areas of what is gifts, what is talent, what does he do, why does he do what he does? And we'll begin to we'll unpack scripture and we'll look at these different areas and, and, and begin to look at it because, and, and really it's like, I have these really big books called theology books that, are, that are, people speak a whole lot smarter than I do and I'm just highlighting and understanding and reading and I, I read about D.L. Uh, Moody, I read his theology on the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit this week and I, uh, just sections and I'm like, wow, this is so, so encouraged me, I'm so encouraged. Just even our, our salvation mentality, we believe for us salvation is the beginning but really salvation is not the beginning. The beginning is God. And then from God comes the works of Christ. And the works of Christ are emulated by, by the Holy Spirit. And then because all three of those are in line, we can experience salvation. But we as Americans feel that our salvation is the beginning when really it was God who was at work from the very beginning of creation. And then Jesus, Holy Spirit, and then us. So things like that that begin to, like, I'm sitting in my office in Panera, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Had my charge lemonade, and I'm like, whoo. But see, even this morning, you may have noticed that I've been saying Holy Spirit and not the Holy Spirit. I've really kind of gone back and forth on this, and this is actual conversation that I was having with our staff this week. I said, we don't say who is the God or who is the Jesus? So why do we always say, who is the Holy Spirit? I even find myself saying the, at other times not saying, you know, and other times not saying the, right? Because even this morning, I'm like, the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. But maybe it is my dislike for the Ohio State Buckeyes. I don't know. Maybe that's where it just comes into being. I don't know. Wow. Wow. You're like, now I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for staying in your seats and not walking out at that moment, right? Some of you are like, down on your side, go blue. I'm like, ugh. I'm just, yeah, not for any one of them. So, But putting the there also states the importance as the one and only. It's something that Pastor Tom shared with us in our text. I get that. So in our text thread, I changed my name to the Josh Plassans. Okay, so I was good. <laughs> Because you all know that there is only one Josh Poissons, and I know that you're thankful that as this world probably could not handle another one. But, the <laughs> but this understanding is then the word uh, of the word, using the word the, though, as Kelly shared. Come on, Kelly's like, oh, no, I'm here in the service. She processed with us, it says the is used when referring to his whole, his role in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is his name and who he is. Jesus, the Son, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. You know, the names have changed. But as you can see, even in, in that one area of understanding Holy Spirit better, we can dig and look at all that is there more than one week of even our understanding as we dig. But one of the things that influenced my understanding of why I don't want to use the word the is from the fact that Holy Spirit is a, a person. He's one of the triune Godhead, one of the three parts of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think I even have a, a slide that has God in the middle uh, on there, maybe a little out of order for there, but God is who we refer to and is represent the triune Godhead as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all making up who God is. This triunity was a word that I saw and I found, I was like, oh, I really like that. This triunity of God is a central place in our faith of understanding the fullness of who God is and how we see him moving in our life, that he is a real person. 
There has been and there will continue, there continues to be teachings that he is just a presence instead of being a person. In early church history, Arius, who denied the personality of the Holy Spirit, he denied it. And that he was, he said that he, the Holy Spirit was only an influence that emulated for, or emanated the, the Father, only just a presence. But in the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD, that teaching and understanding was, was proven as false. And that council then established Holy Spirit as more than an influence, but is just as real as God the Father and God the Son. At the last council at Constantinople in 381, the Nicene Creed was formulated the uphold, that upheld the understanding of the Trinity in regards to the Holy Spirit. We see this is what the Nicene Creed says, and it's, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. Some foundations of what we believe. It's important for us to understand, have an understanding of Holy Spirit and his role in our life because Holy Spirit is, he's a personality and he has a personality. I, I want to just say that if you ever hear something, you know, like the Holy Spirit or it, you don't, like nobody walks up to you and say, you're, you know, well, I'd say pronouns have changed, so I can't really say that anymore. But when somebody says it or all those other things, you're like, that just doesn't seem right and it's not. But we refer to Holy Spirit. Some people say, well, well did, you, did you sense it moving today? We, you know, it just doesn't sound right. We don't refer to each other as, as these things. And so, these, so we look at who Holy Spirit is. There's this mentality and understanding immediately that's challenging the fact of Holy Spirit just being a force and it's, that is exerted by God. But, but there is some components to why this happens because there's the Latin word spiritus, and the, which means breath, and the Greek word pneuma and the Hebrew word ruach, which all means breath and wind as well as spirit. But to stop there would cause us to have an understanding that Holy Spirit is impersonal, that he is only a breath, that he, is only a, uh, that he is only wind. But when we understand that Holy Spirit is a person, that he's somebody that speaks into our, our life, he speaks into our spirit, that as we, we read the word of God, that it comes alive before us. Why? Not because you're so amazing, it's because Holy Spirit's job, one of his jobs is to take what we read and to begin to understand. That he emulates Christ, that he, he makes Christ bigger. And he, he allows us to see him in a way that we sometimes don't see him because Holy Spirit reveals him, magnifies him, makes him larger than life. If you read my Facebook post yesterday, many of you commented on, on it and I just said the battle is real of what we're fighting in our world that we go in. And it says, I'm reading, Revel, I was reading Proverbs and said that train up a child in the way they go. When they're old, they will, will not, uh, not go away from it. And I just said, there is a battle. Why is the, why is the sexuality battle moved into being a sexuality battle amongst our kids? The reason why is because there's a battle for our kids. For a long time as pastors in churches, we would hire youth pastors. And I got, you know, nothing wrong with youth pastors. They're a strange breed too. But, you know, they, but we hired them because the, the statistics said that if somebody didn't accept Christ by the age of 18, the percentage or likelihood of them accepting Christ by the, you know, later on in life went down so significantly. And so all these assemblies of God church, all these churches hired youth pastors. And so, but I was a kid's pastor growing up or after I got saved and went to college and all these things. And, and then the studies began to change and they, they looked at worldview and they said, if an 18 year old, this is an adult worldview, if you come back, when does that worldview, they went age by year by year all the way down and at the age of 13, they saw the worldview change. And I would say even today, because of social media and technology of where it's at, 13 has actually already passed. The worldview has been formed even younger. And so the, there's an importance of us having Pastor Tom as our kids pastor and leading. And sometimes, you know, sometimes as parents, you're like, well, maybe you didn't communicate or do all those things. But listen, you go in the classroom and you, 
nobody has a greater passion for your kids than Pastor Tom. And like, I walked in there on Wednesday night and see all these kids worshiping Jesus and singing out the songs and getting prayer and praying for one another. And you're like, wow, isn't that what we want? Right? And, and so realizing those things, and there was the original conversations, even with Pastor Matt, being like, listen, I, I, I'm gonna, I want to make it, we're going to put more money into that kids' hallway because, you know, we were graduating one or two kids out at that point uh, from kids' church up. But this year, I think we got like five or seven kids moving up from elementary, from fifth grade to sixth grade. They were, I said, don't worry. I told, her, I told Matt, I said, we're going to build that youth group from the kids' level up. And now our, and our kids, now, like, I appreciate our, I know we've got a bunch of older, you know, you guys are older and more mature. I know that most times, but that's right. But, but the, the level, because our kids, you know, Becca, you're teaching JBQ with our kids that they're hiding God's word in their heart. What's going to happen in that group as they continue to grow? We raise up a generation, a remnant and all these things as we begin to see and we correct the doctrines and bring these things into to place into life of what God wants to do, that he is Holy Spirit is, is real. That they, I want, I, I want our kids, I want you to be standing outside the door because our kids are praying for each other at the altar. And I won't, and if you get mad, I'm going to be like, get over it. Because you'll come back to me later and, you know, when uh, these parents that come later and say, well, my kids, you know, they're not, uh, you know, you, I don't know. You just expect that we get an hour or two hours with them a week and we're trying to infuse that Holy Spirit moment, the mountaintop experience with them. And if you don't keep them engaged on those opportunities, then when they get older, you're just producing, train up a child the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. And so I realized there's this battle going on right now. And so yesterday, as I was reading that scripture and realizing the battle that's going on, that we need to understand that, that you know, while different societies, ideals, and all these things are fighting for the life of the future of our world, we as the church have this hope that we have. That we don't have to do this on our own, that, that we can see miracles take place, that our kids can pray for their friends and see these things happen because Holy Spirit is real and he really wants to move in lives. That he can give words of knowledge and he can speak through us and, and to us, somebody that we don't even know and have never even met in our life. And we could, we could have a word of knowledge and understanding of that. And, and so you may be like, what's a word of knowledge, word of wisdom? Don't worry. I'm going to talk about that this summer. At some point, it's on my list. But to back to my point of Holy Spirit being personal, we can see throughout scripture that personal pronouns are used in relation to him. John 16, 13 through 14 says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. The Greek word for spirit in that setting there was a, a gender neutral word, a demonstrative pronoun of ekonais, but that one is used to refer to the Holy Spirit, to Holy Spirit, that when he, that one, he, that one shall glorify me. Is what we see when it comes in. In Ephesians 1, 13 and through 14, we see this masculine relative pronoun to refer to the Spirit, that you were sealed in him with holy, the Holy Spirit of promise, who, that who is masculine, in Ephesians that is given as a pledge of our inheritance. Not only then do we see personal pronouns that are related to him, but we also see the personal characteristics that ascribe to who he is. The definition of a person is one possessing intelligence, emotion, or feeling and will. Holy Spirit in, uh, possesses intelligence. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I've got that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 10 through 12. It says, For to us revealed uh, them, uh, to us, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For he, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man who is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God are, are uh, no one knows except the Spirit of God. 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. That God searches all, that the Holy Spirit searches all these things and he knows what God is wanting. He knows the will and the desire of the Father. That he gives to us wisdom from his wisdom and knowledge and that word of wisdom as we'll talk about in a couple weeks from 1 Corinthians 12, 8. And, and the other seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit possesses emotion and feeling. The Holy Spirit, he, he loves. Romans 15, 30. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the, the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Holy Spirit is grieved. And Ephesians 4, 13 uh, 430, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed with the day for the day of redemption. So we see intelligence, we see emotion and feeling, but Holy Spirit also possesses a will. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. We talk about Holy Spirit, it's not just the pronouns and the characteristics, but it's also his personal actions that are attributed to him. He speaks in Acts 13, 2, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called for them. He testifies in John 1, 15, 26, that when the helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. He teaches in John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. He intercedes for us in Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he searches the hearts, know, he searches the hearts knowing that what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He guides us in John 16, 13, that when he, when he, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is yet to come. He, the Holy Spirit, he, he gives commands and ordains us once again from Acts 13, 2, saying, set apart to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called you. He also works miracles. In Acts 39, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Holy Spirit is not just sitting on a, a throne, sitting on a place, a, a pedestal. He is alive and moving, and he is personally active in our lives if we allow him to be. But it's also he has personal relationships that he maintains with us, with the Father. He maintains from Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There is an equality in the name and personal identity of, with the Father and with the Son. He has a personal relationship with Christ as we see in John 16, 14. He will glorify me for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. Holy Spirit is, was the fulfillment of the promise that was spoken by Jesus of what the Father would do. He has a personal relationship that he maintains with us as believers. Acts 15, 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to, lay, to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. This is when the apostles were, were wanting to know the will and desire of the Holy Spirit to build the structure and, and put the local church together. Finally, there is a clarity and a resolve in Jesus' discourse at the end of the book of John when he speaks once again from John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may, he may be with you forever. Once again, this is the signifying the importance and the reality of Holy Spirit being a person and part of the Godhead. This is a great representation for us of, of the Trinity. That this, in this scripture, I is Jesus and Father is God. Helper, he is the Holy Spirit. And when Holy Spirit comes, it will be the result of the Son's praying and sending, the Father sending in the Son's name and the Spirit's proceeding. 
Friends, I, I, I think you can see just from this short little time here so far this morning that there is a lot to cover as we walk in through these next several weeks and talk about who is Holy Spirit and what does he want to do and how does he want to move in your life. It's not going to be weird or all these things. We'll back up with scripture and I encourage you to come prepared to take notes, prepared to jump in and to engage in these things because I want you to have a better understanding. I want to be able to help you correct doctrine that's wrong. I want you to be able to not just do that, but why is all that? Why do we understand doctrine? Why do we understand these things? Because most importantly, I want you to, to understand that so you can have an experience with the Holy Spirit that is real. And then when you do experience his realness and his presence, that it only confirms what you've written or what you've seen in the word. And in the fullness of that, you'll be able to be like, wow, look who he is. Look at what he's done. Look at how he's moved. We'll begin. Today was simply for me just a, a quick shot in, in the arm to say, here's just an overview real quick, and we're going to dig in over this summer, and I want you to encourage you to be here, but I want you to um, also begin to pray this prayer that you would ask the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to you in a fresh and new way. That he would give to you the wisdom and understanding that he has so that you and I can be all that he's called us to be and that we can do all that he's called us to do. Amen? Amen. Come on, we, we need his power. We need his presence. I'm all right to kind of have moved through some of this fairly quickly because I, I am thankful. I, I am, Grant, I appreciate it. the team that was here, just the willingness that there was, a, there was something that broke today in that moment. And I, I know that, that you, many of you felt and sensed that in that moment, and that's why we didn't rush through that moment. And what we just waited in that time, because I can come up here and say as many as words as I want, but when Holy Spirit speaks to you or he touches you in that instant, everything can change. And if we create an environment where he's welcome to move, I, I don't have to preach, but I do feel like I do need to share the word. I do need to bring the word. We will declare the word in our worship, but we also declare the word as we, we dig into the, to the message and, and all these places because that edifies, that emulates, that encourages, that helps us. That's why we're doing, we read the Bible through in a year because, because we get the whole scope of what God wants to do. And there's parts that sometimes you're just like, I just got to get through this and I got behind last week, so I was reading two, two days a week for uh, two days a day for a couple days in there to get caught back up. And you're just like just reading and reading. But in that moment yesterday, I was, I was sitting there and, and, and drinking my coffee, that word, those words just popped out. And I'm like, you know what? I need to stop right here for a moment. That we can be going on our way and, and, you know, like Holy Spirit could tell you to turn down a different road or go down a different aisle at the store. Why? Because maybe you're going to run into somebody that he wants you to run into that you haven't seen in a while. Or he's got something, a word that he wants you to speak to somebody in that moment and just be available to him. And that's not weird. The world says it's weird because they don't know the one who sent him. We know the one who sent him. And let it become normal to us. Let it become who God's, you know, like we're ingrained, we're made, we're designed to, uh, the fabric of our being is built to be able to follow Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as he works and moves through our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, God, even more. This, we thank you for the power of your word. We also thank you, Lord, for the, your presence this morning of what you've done and how you've moved in this service. God, I pray within each one of us, you would place a hunger and a desire for you, that we would hunger and thirst for righteousness, we would hunger and thirst for godliness, that we'd hunger and thirst for you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and move in our hearts and lives. Would you change us? Would you make us more like you as we continue to worship and honor you? Lord, we ask tonight for your blessing on Pastor Eric, as he prepares and finishes his message uh, and processes, pray for the worship team that'll gather here from multiple churches that'll gather this afternoon. God, would you move and knit them together in such a way that only you can do. Father, I pray for the unity of the pastors and leaders that'll be in this room, the brethren and the, the brothers and sisters of our, of our leaders of our area, Lord God, that we would just be a, 
uh, coherence together of what you want to do, Lord, that we would just be knit together. And we pray for the body to see each other uh, in, in different cultures and ethnicities and, and the styles of worship and all these things. But more importantly, God, we ask, Father, for those that need to come to you to, to give their lives to you. May that happen tonight. And those that are coming hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they, but God, may they not just see tongues, but they may they seek you tonight and leave from this place forever changed. God, we need you. We need your presence. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our church. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in the lives of each of these members and individuals and all that you're doing that you're allowing us to do in this season. And we choose to bless and honor you today in your precious name. And everyone said, amen. Church, be blessed. We'll see you tonight. We're back here. Six o'clock is the service tonight. So go home, take your nap, and make sure you get back here ready to go. Amen.